Hey guys, and welcome to Let's Play Xenosaga Episode 3. For the third time in a row, I again will not be attempting the German subtitle. You're welcome. Anyway, this there's a lot to get into before we can really get into this Let's Play, so let's go straight to her. This is the third and final game of the Xenosaga Trilogy. Do note that there are little side games that go with it. It is also, I guess, technically the fourth big game in the Xeno series as a whole. That being said, I will be allowing spoilers and I will be talking about spoilers from the previous games. Obviously, you will need to have a working knowledge of the previous games to make sense of many of the things in this game. You don't need them to just play through and win the game. It's not like you need to know certain events in order to know where to go, but you do need to know what's going on, otherwise you'll be confused as all hell. Hell, if you've already played Episode 1 and Episode 2, you're still going to be confused as all hell because that's Xenosaga in a nutshell. However, because it's part of a larger series, I will also be talking about Xeno Gears. I will be allowing spoilers for those games in the comments as well. This entire LP, as with Episode 1 and Episode 2, I will be talking about spoilers right now. So don't talk about any spoilers for this game, but spoilers from the previous games that we've already worked up to, those are fair game. Now, this game has some interesting changes, just like pretty much every other Xenosaga game. Every time they make another Xeno game, there's a whole whack ton of changes and everything's completely different. This is something that Final Fantasy tries to do and fails. In Xenosaga's case, there's successes and there are failures. Now, my computer, or my controller already went to sleep. That's great. Okay, so we have numerous options here. Data. Uh, I'm gonna skip this for now. What this does is it leads you to a memory code thing, and for whatever reason, it's really kind of finicky. It doesn't like the uh, controller very well. Basically, this allows you to watch any of the cutscenes in the game. Later on, we will get access to swimsuits like we have in every other Xenosaga game. Eventually, once we beat the game, we will unlock swimsuit mode, and we'll be able to put our characters into their swimsuits during cutscenes. And so it just plays them out, not the um, the 3D rendered cutscenes, but the pre-rendered stuff with the sprites. Any of those that use the same, similar sprites to battle sprites, we can insert our characters in their swimsuits into those events. Uh, there are some additional outfits as well, uh, aside from just swimsuits, and I will be showing, well, them off, uh, just in general. There's not really a whole lot to it. Now, Character Viewer shows you different characters in the game, from main characters to side characters to enemies, whatever. Uh, mechs and enemies are also available in here. These get unlocked as you progress through the game. There's not a whole lot of point in it, so I'm not going to really go over it. Episode 1 here is basically just a recount, and it probably takes, you know, 5 to 10 minutes to go through it. Uh, episode 2... Same for episode two. They give you an ability to go back and learn what happened in the previous games before you get into this one. Um, they put some images up so you can kind of see how things go. But since we just experienced those games and probably should have a working knowledge before coming into this, we're pretty much good on that front. Now, one additional thing. This game does not run flawlessly on this emulator. Now, let me take a look here. Let's pop this up. I know you probably can't see my mouse because I usually turn that off. Go to config, video, down to plugin settings. That will freeze the emulator when you're working on it. Now, this may look different depending on which version of the emulator you have. I have PCSX version 1.0.0 revision 5350, and I am running a an AMD 7970, I think. I think that's what card I'm running. So I don't have DirectX 12, or I don't have DirectX 13, or whatever the newest one is. Now, the settings that I have already set up have been working for me for every other game that I've played on this emulator. Save for this one, there's one weird graphical issue. And in order to fix this, you remove it from Direct3D11 hardware, to software, and that will fix it. 
Now, what this does is it runs slightly slower. Not in general, but when applying fast forward. That being the case, um, I have, well, when I did my test run for the game, I left it off. Uh, I turned it on so I could make sure it worked for the first half of the game. For the second half of the game, since it was slowing down my fast forward, I turned it off so I could get through the rest of the game faster. I am going to show the slight difference that it makes, but I'll probably be leaving it on for the vast majority of the LP. With that being said, we get another special feature by unlocking clear data from episode two. In this case, it doesn't matter what level we are, there is only one real benefit. So let's load that. We earn one extra uniform for Xion. That's it, nothing else. Kind of weird that way. All right, I'm gonna turn the vibration off. And yeah, make sure your subtitles are on for the Let's Play, perfect. Let us experience Xenosaga Episode 3. This is the planet Mictum. We don't know much about this place, other than the fact that it's on fire and holy shit, there are noses. We probably don't want to go here. Anyone want to bet if we're actually going to go here? Yeah. That pendant looks familiar. But these people, not so much. There's another big tower. I've seen a bunch of those throughout uh, this series. As you can tell immediately, there is a completely different feel to this game from episode two and from episode one. The emotional music has returned. Even though episode two had great music, the emotional music has really returned in this game. Kid kind of looks familiar. Huh? I'm getting Superman flashbacks. What? mother just turned into what looks like a gnosis right in front of his face. Damn, this game is dark already. This game kind of ties into Xenogears in that way. There's a lot of dark aspects to it. Okay. Now, you may have not even known that I could just do what I just did. I'm going to talk about this for a quick second. Looks like things are going smoothly. What they've introduced into this game is cutscenes that are done in this way. As you can see, the dialogue has stopped and it's not going forward automatically. There is no spot in this entire game, save for maybe the manual, which I should probably read, I haven't read that in a long time, that says you can do this. but throughout the entirety of my test run, I had to press the circle button every time we got to a piece of dialogue to advance the dialogue. And I absolutely hated it. You're as friendly as ever. It takes too long to dick around and you always forget to press the button. You can't just put the controller down and walk over and do something else or whatever you want to do. You can't take a drink. You can't do much of anything. However, like I said, they, they never show it in-game. There's no reference to it in-game that you can do this. But if you press the select button during any of these full-screen cutscenes, you notice the one before we had a, a 21 by 9 aspect ratio or whatever it was, super wide screen. Yeah, you can't do it then. But if you do it now and you press the select button, you'll engage auto mode. Well, I will be I'm turning sure this I'm on and off. The big guns. 
because do we really need this thing? Auto mode is on. Automatically the does this, the the uh, cutscene. Fifteen years ago, took place in an incomplete fashion. If I want to we comment must on something, the arrows. I'll press the select button. Hmm. So, you knew all along, huh? We know You're some one of you guys. Guy. I bet you can't wait to see the look on her face when she finally knows everything. Who? So. This is our princess. I thought she was in another castle. She smells good. And you're still creepy as all ever. I've fallen in love already. Well, that's what the testaments are up to. There has been a one year gap. Between the end of Xenosaga Episode 2 and the beginning of Xenosaga Episode 1. Miyuki, you didn't tell me that they had macrophages deployed. What the hell have you been doing? Ugh. Take it easy. I checked it out the best I could. It's not my fault. But that does not explain. Just appeared out of nowhere. Why any of this is happening? On supporting me instead of making excuses. You may recognize Xion's voice as not being from the previous game, but being from episode one. <laughs> you two make a fine pair. And I love that voice. Doctors. Three at seven o'clock. You got it? Yeah, I'm on it. There's a nice little in-joke with the uh, voice actress they chose to play Doxie. And I would go into that when we're not in a huge cutscene. Ow. Thank you. Question, where are we? That was a vector symbol. Wait that was a minute. Incredible, Kanan. The way you maneuvered that Ames was unbelievable. We don't have time for that kind of thing, Miyuki. Has anything come up on the scanner yet? And yes, that is still the I ESD. I hope you Dina. understand that what we're after poses a considerable threat to Vector. I'd appreciate you taking the situation more seriously. Exactly. I don't care if you get yourself killed. Just don't take us down with you. Seriously. All right, all right fine. Why is everyone picking on no me? No doubt. Feel sorry for poor Miyuki. Well, is this it, Miyuki? Confirming coordinates. Yep, perfect. No doubt about it. This is Vector's S-Line division. Then the top secret data we want is just ahead. Shion and Miyuki work for Vector. I'll handle backup. You three take care of the rest. Why are we breaking into Vector? You're not gonna help, Doctus? Don't depend on others to do everything for you. Usus Magister est Optimus. Yes, Doctus loves to speak in Latin. Now, there are two lines that she Hurry. gets. I want to be as far from here as possible when our pursuit arrives. And I'm sure they're going to be here very I shortly. I know, I know! With that said, we get a little brief tutorial. Well, we get a bunch of really brief tutorials. They don't last all that long, but there's a lot of them, so... Anyway, we made a note of the information you should know ahead of time. Please access the database. Yes, the database makes a return. I've referenced this uh, when we were actually playing episode two. And if you enter the database, you'll see that we have a bunch of information here. Now, there's a lot of stuff that we could learn by clicking on all these different ones. Later on, these will get updated and we'll learn more information about them as time goes on. Right now, we have 4% of the uh, things that we can get. And if you go to story, uh, pretty much all of these, save for the final one, 
account for the information that we would have learned if we had gone to episode one and episode two in the beginning of the menu in the data section there. So I'm not going to go over those. This one I will go over, and unfortunately the database dump already starts. I'm not going to try my best not to dump like whole episodes, if at all possible. But this one is the end of episode two to what's happening now. This one we need to know. Half a year since the destruction of the planet Milsha was brought about by the Ormus Patriarch Sergius. That's the timeline we're looking at, six months after that. The Gnosis phenomenon occurring in star systems throughout the Galaxy Federation was accelerating its rate of expansion and more than 30% of all solar systems had suffered devastating damage. The Galaxy Federation government and the autonomous states viewed the situation as critical and made, advance, made an advancement of the grand anti-Gnosis Zohar project their highest priority. The contact subcommittee, which Yuli is part of, were frantically dealing with the situation. Now, it was at this time that an incident occurred in which planet's major cities were attacked by the Gnosis. Localized Gnosis phenomenon had been observed numerous times before this point, but this incident differed in a significant way. The damage was always centered around a specific urban area, almost as if an intelligent factor were at work. This became uh, known as the Gnosis Terrorism. There's a database entry about that that I would like to take a look at too. Basically, Yuli and the contact subcommittee sent in Junior, Jin, and everybody else. They visited the site of an attack where they encountered a girl calling herself Nephilim. Do note that this is not the same Nephilim. This event here is actually a reference back to Xenosaga A Missing Year, which was a series of flash videos released on the, I think it was the Namco website, Namco Bandai's website, uh, shortly before the release of Xenosaga Episode 3. They were never officially translated, however, fan translations are a brilliant thing, and they've all been translated by fans and put on YouTube. Now, I will include a link to a playlist that I made that contains other people's videos. I did not make these, which is why I'm not going to just go and review and say all the information in them. I'm going to go over this, which gives you a basic idea of what happens. If you want to know what happened in this time that led Xion from working for Vector to breaking into Vector, you probably want to experience that game. Anyway, I will leave a link in the uh, description there so you guys can check that out. Uh, credit to all the people who worked on the translation. Uh, I don't know any of them, but you know, they did a great job. Okay, believing, okay, so Jin visited the site of the attack. They encountered someone who said was Nephilim, but was not. Shortly thereafter, uh, their path was blocked by Doctus, someone we're working with right now. Kind of weird. Uh, from the mysterious Scientia organization, and yes, that's how they pronounce it in the game, uh, even though it looks like Scientia or something to that effect, it, they call it Scientia, so we're just going to roll with that. Now, Scientia, you may recall, was created uh, by uh, Melise Ortis, who was, um, oh, sorry, uh, from Ziggy's timeline uh, when he was alive. Uh, she was one of the people that worked with him during the Voyager incidents, and eventually she joined the anti-UMN group, group, and eventually she became deleted, and then she took it over and created Scantia, kind of combined some of the other anti-UMN groups to create this one really big one. That being said, let's move forward. Nope, did you just jump all the way down there? Okay. Uh, where were we here? I pressed a button that I shouldn't have. There we go. So, the contact subcommittee's examination revealed that the girl was a special type of realian. In addition, they detected in her brain waves the same wave pattern data that give as that given off by Limageton, which we don't know much about. It was a program created to analyze the Zohar during the area when Lost Jerusalem existed basically Earth. That program, however, had fragmented during the Milchian conflict and was scattered through the UMN in, in the form of Lemageton fragments. This 
bleeds into the storyline of the missing year flash animations. Uh, it's not particularly important all around talking about the fragments, so we're just going to skim over that. As Jin's, Jin's group continued their investigation of the girl and the Megaton, they discovered that the series of attacks was being caused by a man named Grimoire. Now, we don't actually get the entry for him yet, but I will be showing it off probably at the start of the next episode to just kind of clue us in and keep that storyline in our heads as we move forward. The Gnosis under Grimoire's control attacked the conscious er, contact subcommittee's lab where the girl was being protected. Yuli and the girl were trapped in the occupied lab, sent a message to Xion, Xion comes with Cosmos, they kick the crap out of everybody, and they try and rescue the girl and Yuli, and depending on which version of this story you read, Jin as well. There's a lot of contradiction in this story, this alternate, or not alternate, this uh, bridging story. Anyway. Xion's group succeeded in suppressing the Gnosis and risking Yuli, but the girl was captured by Grimoire. Working together with Doctus, even though they were enemies just a little while ago, uh, they began searching for Grimoire. Jin and Xion finally discovered the location, but Xion learned that the UMN Vector and her father had been involved in the incident. Now, we get more information on this as the plot progresses, so I'm not going to go into the database on that too much at the moment. To uncover Grimoire's true nature and to rescue the captured girl, Xion resolved to break into a region of the UMN that was under special vector control, hence where we are now. With the help of Scantia, Jin's group, and the girl herself, the incident finally drew to a close. This was a separate event, there's actually two break-ins to vector locations. Um, the one that they're talking about here already happened. In fact, I believe this happened about six months ago in the game's timeline. But uh, it's happening again now as we're breaking into a different part to learn something else, but it relates to the same uh, same part. But learning of Vector and her father's involvement, uh, the incident weighed heavily on Xion's heart, unable to endure her emotions any longer. She finally left Vector. There were some other incidents in that as well, uh, due to the fact that... Um, region of the UMN they broke into was under Vector's control. Xion was somewhat punished for that, although she was allowed to stay on. She, of her own volition, decided to leave because she didn't have enough faith in Vector any longer. Now, uh, no Scantia. As I said, Melise Ortis uh, from Ziggy's timeline was part of the establishment of this group and their whole goal is to interact with the UMN, but they're an anti-UMN group, so they don't want to just use it. They have their own proprietary network technology that they want to access the information, but then they also want to um, circumvent the power that the UMN seems to have over everything. Remember, the UMN is basically like this global galaxy-wide internet and search for the truth behind it and Vector. Uh, S-Line Division, where we are now. Now, this is the term for Vector's data administration section within the UMN, categorized into four ranks based on the level of importance. S-Line, where Vector's classified information is stored, is the highest ranking section. Therefore, it cannot be accessed without the CEO's permission. I don't think Wilhelm is going to give us permission for this. Grimoire, mastermind behind the Gnosis Terrorism, was isolated within S-Division in a place known as Ars Nova. Nova, Novae, depending on which part of the game we're at. He controlled the Gnosis from within S-Division as he attacked cities on multiple planets. Now, his reasoning is explained in uh, a new, another database entry that I'll go over in the next episode. But I have to load my completed database file in order to get access to that. Gnosis Terrorism Along with several accomplices, the ringleader, a man named Grimoire Vernum, manipulated the Gnosis and attacked capital cities of several planets. According to reports from the Contact Subcommittee, which uh, was responsible for the investigation, Grimoire and his accomplices all died within the UMN. Their goals and the methods by which they control the Gnosis are still unknown. Uh, we do learn a little bit more about it, but not a huge amount. There's not 
a great deal of explanation uh, science-wise of what's going on here. More so just a bridging story so we know why certain events have happened and why our characters are leading toward this and toward that. Furthermore, Xion Jin were involved in the incident. After its resolution, the Cosmos project was halted and Xion decided to leave as Vector. Uh, and yeah, so Doctus, here we learn a little bit more about um, the, uh, the fancy lady with the cool glasses. Woman who carries out her missions in a calm, collected manner. She met Jin uh, six months ago during the investigation into Nos terrorism and subsequently followed Xion when she left Vector to join in her investigating Vector in the UMN. Well, it's kind of the other way around. Xion's kind of working with Skianti at this point, which Doctus, of course, is um, an agent of the top line there. Her body is a remote control type android controlled by the real Doctus by projecting her consciousness into the artificial brain to manipulate the body. Real location is top secret, information even within the ranks of Skiantia, and is only known by a select few of the higher ups. So we already heard the first one, practice makes perfect, and later on we'll get another one uh, to air as human. We don't get a lot of lines from her. But the voice actress, they chose to play her, a character who has her consciousness or her ghost projected into a shell that's not hers. Yeah, the uh, voice actress also played Motoko Kusanagi in the Ghost in the Shell series, uh, specifically the standalone complexes, uh, though she didn't get the, to reprise her role in the new Ghost in the Shell Arise, which I have not seen yet. But anyway, that's pretty much all I wanted to go over in here. I don't think there's any... Ah, one more. UMN. Now, the UMN is a very complicated concept that basically, not only is it the global internet, but it strings together all of the events in the Xenosaga universe. And to really understand it would be to go really deep into theoretical physics and uh, philosophy and stuff like that. So I'm not gonna go too, too far into it. But just know that there is a lot of information you can learn about this if you look into uh, the ideas of a collective unconscious. Anyway, so yeah, basically it is its global internet. It was developed. Stop pressing the wrong button. I keep scrolling way too far, way too fast somehow. Okay, the UMN was developed by Vector after Lost Jerusalem disappeared. Its administration was then handed over to the Galaxy Federation. However, no records remain from its development period, so there's no way to verify any of these details. Lately, a large number of Gnosis, Gnosis terrorism, basically. Skip. The Undis Mundus refers to Carl Jung's theory of collective unconscious and explain the inconsistencies of synchronicity and the EPR paradoxes from physics standpoint. Again, not getting into that. I don't understand it. I don't expect you to either. If you do, thumbs up for you. As well as the mutual com complementary connection. I, I can't speak today. And relationship between two minds and between mind and matter. In the story, it, is, it refers to a collective unconscious network where human consciousness are overlaid with and rendered alongside the network. Now, this could lead into a whole huge conversation that would lead into much spoilers for the game com coming up. So I'm not going to do that, but I did want to go over this basic stuff so we can get a handle on what's going on, why we're here, and all of this information. We did come prepared. You wanted to add a lot more files. And you are right. If you skip the database, skip all the cutscenes, and then just go through what you have to, it will take you an hour to get to the first town. And you'll already have nearly 50% of the database unlocked. That's how much information there is that she's holding back on us. And more so. Uh, many of the things in the database are things that relate back to Episode 1's database. There's additional information about what happened in Episode 2, and some other stuff from this game. Walk over to the save point, which of course we know is a save point. It still heals us just like Episode 2, 
and we can save. And that will give us a database update. Now, every time we get a database update, you'll notice that uh, new things appear. I think this one just gave us that one, which we don't need to look at, but anyway. For the most part, I'm not gonna go huge into long database entries like this, but we really need to know what's going on prior to starting this game because the game doesn't do a very good job of explaining it on its own. But that's all for this one, and I'll see you guys next time.